I am not quite sure, I was told, I was not told what I'm going to be talking about tonight, but um, Gaylord suggested your war experiences. Well, the trouble with my war experiences, the war lasted five years. I'm not going to talk to you for five years. Um, my little part in it started when I left Trinidad, I suppose, in November 1941, and went to England. But before that, I think I ought to tell you, I was at school at St. Mary's College, and one of the subjects I did, and it was the only school in Trinidad that taught, it was classical Greek. There were ten of us doing Greek in my year, of whom Six of us joined the Royal Air Force, which is a pretty heavy percentage. And I remember them very well. One of them went on the same boat I went to in November 1941, Kenneth Rawlings. We were everybody, of course, in those days, just after the Battle of Britain, everybody wanted to be a pilot. We had an exam at a place called Abbey House in Baker Street in London. You must remember, the Battle of Britain was fought largely by pilots, almost entirely by pilots. That was all over in November 1941. America was not yet in the war. When we got to England, Americans got into the war on the 7th of December 1941 when the Japanese bombed the Pearl Harbor. The RAF realized now they would have to go on the offensive if they had taken over, taken over the whole of Europe. The RAF realized that they had to go on the offensive instead of the defensive. The offensive meant largely putting troops on the ground in Europe, and that couldn't possibly happen for quite a few years. So the bombing had to start. But bombing requires navigators. They already had none. It was estimated that at the start of the bombing of Europe, 80% of the RAF bombs were not finding the target. So you had to get navigators. Kenrick Rawlings, who was in class with me and doing Greek at St. Mary's, and I were picked to be navigators. One of the interesting things about it is when they discovered that the the difficulty was finding the target, and that is the navigator's job. 
And so they decided to recruit navigators. And according to what I was told, what Kenrick and I were told, to curb our disappointment at not being made pilots, was that we can always get pilots, we have lots of them, but we can't find the target, we need navigators. And crazy Australian called Don Bennett, their vice sponsor Donald Bennett, had the idea to form a pathfinder force whose job was find the target. To set up flares over the target and the bombers, the big bombers coming behind would bomb our flares because our flares are supposed to be in the target. And that is when I lost the Trinidad habit of being late for everything. We were told your players have to go up at a particular time. You are allowed 10 seconds, 10 seconds, either way. If you cannot find the target and pick your players up at the time we tell you, give or take 10 seconds, you bring them back because Germans are not fools. They don't know what color our players are going to be on a particular night. But the moment the first player goes up, the Germans, within, we were told, within 30 seconds, will have the same color players 50 miles away. Their players will go over open field. So we were told that you cannot find the target and bomb within 10 seconds at the time, we tell you, you bring them back. That is how I have this fetish for punctuality which lasts me to this very day. Now, we then went, and there were one or two interesting comments I have to make on going to England for the first time. I never even visited Tobago. We couldn't understand, and one of the things we discovered very early on, we knew about the English, they knew absolutely nothing about us. Where did you learn to speak English? Well, Julian Marichaud, who was a fighter pilot from Grenada, and you know the name Marichaud from Grenada, Julian taught us to that. Tell them you came on a boat, it took 10 days, you were a very quick study, and that's when you learned English. The second thing we couldn't understand is, how do people know where their house is? Because every house in the street looks exactly the same. In Trinidad, of course, as you know, houses are different, but they were in my time. Now, now we have a rather high-rise thing to keep a living. That wasn't so in 1941. You've got to remember, 1941 was a long time ago. I don't suppose many of you were born then. So eventually I got, and I will tell you, my first course, navigation course, was at a place called Hemsworth in Lincolnshire. So I went in, that was the first elementary course. Went in on the first morning, Kenny College and I posted to two different places. I never saw him again until he joined my squadron, 1994. Went into classes the very first morning, my first RAF course as a navigator. And at the end of the first day, I asked to see the education officer. And I was ushered into his office. And I asked him, how long is this course? And he said, it's six weeks. And I said, well, it's a waste of six weeks because the stuff they are teaching us is elementary stuff that we, I think we all know already. So he said, I said, can I go on to the next course, wherever it is? And he said, well, I'll have to get on to the air ministry and uh, see what can happen. So I said, but I don't want to be sitting down doing nothing for six weeks. He said, okay, now I should get a reply within a week. But I tell you what you could do. You could go to the control tower. It was um, 
apart from being a small navigator's course, it was a Wellington bombing quadrant with Polish pilots. After about two days in the control tower, and I was told what to do to bring the pilots down and talk to them, etc. The chief controller came to me and said, um, the pilots would like to meet you. I said, whatever for? He said, no, we'll just try to meet you. So I said, okay. Well, tomorrow morning when they're doing nothing, they can come and go I didn't know they want to see me. So the pilots came, four of them came, fools, and I started with them. And I asked them, I said, why on earth did you want to meet me? They, they couldn't, didn't know who I was, they didn't see me. They said, well, you're the first person in the control tower whose English you can understand. <laughs> the other controllers were all English. And that reminds me that today, that when Mr. Sasser formed a commission or committee to teach the English English, they picked a Trinidadian Trevor McDonald as chairman. <laughs> Now, uh, anyway, I went on oh, before that to, to show how the English did not know anything about us. People would ask you, do you live in trees or do you live in houses like other people? And the English one, the English one, was the funniest thing about the English one was you go into a pub drinking with English people and chatting and somebody, especially in London, somebody of the local at some stage, is going to say, oh, you can speak the hey, English and nobody does it. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, the, I, I went to the control tower, and within a week, the airman said, yes, I could go to the next course, which was an elementary air observer's course in Eastbourne, which is a south coast town, which is German, unfortunately, used from every Sunday morning. And to J.U.88 no, used to come to drop bombs every Sunday morning. And the whole, all the hotels on the front were taken over by RAF air crew cadets. So I better tell you that there was conscription in England. Everybody over 18 had to be conscripted to go into their forces, into the RAF, the Army, the Navy, whatever. But not as air crew. Air crew, all, every person in an aeroplane had to volunteer for their crew. You could not be conscripted into an aeroplane from the Royal Air Force during World War II. Everybody in an aeroplane was a volunteer to be in the aeroplane. Now, the, another thing which is very interesting is that nearly all our navigation instructors were former merchant seamen. I read you nothing about navigation. Those who had to teach us were ex-merchant seamen. And we used to call them ancient mariners. We were all very young, remember. Then, after that, I went on a course at Cranwell Bomb Aiming Course. And my salary was skyrocketed because you have to, to be a bomb aimer, you have to be in an airplane. And the, our pay as right, the lowest rank in the Air Force of AC2 was two shillings and six pence per day. When we got into an airplane doing bomb aiming and wireless operating, our salary jumped up to seven shillings and six pence a day. Five shillings flying to <laughs> So I did a course on bomb aiming, wireless operator. We then went to a navigation school on the west coast of Scotland. And remarkably, one of the staff pilots at West School, the people who flew us around while we did our navigational exercises, was a Trinidadian called David Rochford, who was, I think, the last Trinidadian to be seen in World War II. And his nephew 
also called David Rothschild as a good friend of mine in Canada. And uh, this is very interesting because that was my last navigational course and from that course after our exams it is then you then have an interview and it is then decided there's nobody in an aeroplane during World War II of a lower rank than sergeant. At the end of your navigation course, you, you had your exam and the, you were not marked in any order of merit in your exam. The RAF had three grades for marking. Average, above average, below average. Nothing. And uh, the station commander at my last navigation course decided to close down the whole station on the west coast of Scotland in November, and everybody on the station would go on a six mile cross country race. The next day we had interviews whether you were going to be an officer or a sergeant. And as I walked into the interview room, salute the group captain who was interviewing me, he got up, he returned my salute, got up and came over, shook hands and said, Congratulations, you were splendid race yesterday across, which I, I had won the cross country race. Um, and his next, his only question for the whole of these was, Cross, do you know Larry Constantine? I said, yes sir, I do. You spent the whole half hour in the talk and cooking. <laughs> I got a commission. I always, I always blame Larry Constantine for my commission. <laughs> One other Larry Constantine story, maybe two more. Larry and I became very friendly. And after the war, I was going out to Africa. And I'd come back to Trinidad and I went back to England and I was going out to Africa on holiday. I was working at the BBC at the time as a sort of producer. And I told Larry, I was Larry and George Patmore with whom I became very friendly, that I was going out to Africa. So they gave me, I was going to Ghana, so they gave me letters to Nkuma. And they both said yes, and Larry said, look, let's have lunch, and I'll bring the letter for you. And he said, let's have lunch, at least up at the Savoy, so I said, fine. I, I was there earlier, of course, and um, Larry came, and then we went into the Savoy dining room together. And I was absolutely taken aback. Every person in the Savoy dining room got up when they were walking to come and take his hand. He was then, he was not a Lord Constantine, he was then Sir Larry at the time. And every single man in that Savoy dining room rushed to Larry Constantine just to take his hand. <laughs> and he gave me the letter room, and so did Lord Sargent. And I went to Ghana on holiday. But that was long after the war. During the war, I was posted. When I went, I was commissioned, so I had to go into London to get my officer's uniform. And I got my officer's uniform, and I walked round the corner from the tailors to Oxford Street to a photographer and had my photograph taken. I never saw that, but I said the photograph, two copies I sent to Trinidad to my family. I never saw that photograph again until about three months ago. My niece, my brother Neville's daughter, found it somewhere and showed it to me. My younger daughter saw the photograph. Remember, I was 24 years old at the time. Saw the photograph and children do. She looked at it and said, Daddy, you know something? When you were young, you weren't bad looking. <laughs> That's it, darling. So were we all when we are young. <laughs> now, I, I went and I was posted to a mosquito training unit. Mosquito had just come out really as an airplane. It was made of plywood. 
and then we could already join my squadron. That first I had seen him since we, we got on, we left the boat together. And uh, Henry joined my squadron. I had been in the squadron for a little while. And he joined the squadron. Unfortunately, he was shot. We were doing low level daylight. When I say low level, I mean low level. Just to And what we did, you went in in formation. And under the radar. When you got to the target, and it was, that is a, not navigation, but map reading, because you have maps in you, and you went in the formation. When you got to the target, just approaching the target, you went up to 1200 feet. You then, then did a shallow dive onto the target. In those days, you were, you were bombing mainly workshops. Mm -hmm. They were staying in line because to prevent the transport of German troops throughout Europe. You then did a bomb, a shallow dive, and dropped your bomb on the target, which you identified by sight. The problem was, of course, that if you did that and you, you, know, you dropped your bomb, say, about 100 feet above the target, you bomb yourself out of existence because the bombs would explode and move yourself up. So all the bombs had 11 second delay. So you drop your bombs and you immediately did a, a steep right hand climbing curve so that you shouldn't bomb yourself. And then you came back, then you came back individually, you didn't come back in formation. We came back in the beginning, you have to find the first navigation, came in with the game, this is the natural And you found your way individually back. Kenry Rowling, I didn't know it was Kenry was shot down at the time. I saw that one of the formations had been shot down, shot in the foot. We were under the radar, but we could see. And at first, when we first started, just, you know, flying over the coast of just a few we used to laugh at them. The, the, the mosquito was so fast, the Germans were not allowing enough deflection. And nobody was thought, oh, we got away with it. But the Germans, not being very, not being stupid, soon caught up with our speed, and we were beginning, losses began to mount. And Kenneth was one of the unfortunate ones, who on his seventh operation, he was shot down. Then, when the bombing of Germany and of the five Europe started in earnest, we were bombing, we went night bombing from 25,000 feet. We were not yet in the Pathfinder force. Now, the senior air staff officer, the man who recruited the Pathfinder, there's a man called Hamid Mahadi. So I think there's an old man. We always, always called him Old Hamid. He must have been at least 35. <laughs> and but he, everybody referred him as Old Hamid. And he started, and he's, he's written a book. I have his book. He started by going to squadrons and saying, I want your two best pilots and your two best navigators. Naturally, any sense of a squadron commander does not give away with his best crew. So Henry soon discovered that they were giving him the crew they been trying to get rid of sometimes. So they gave him the worst pilot and the worst navigator. <laughs> but Henry soon discovered it. And I spoke to him about it after the war. And he said, I decided the only way to do things, I go to a squadron and said, you are now a Pathfinder squadron. The whole squadron is a Pathfinder squadron. And I will get rid of the people I didn't want. And that's what he did. He did it for our squadron. He said, one senior is now a Pathfinder squadron. He started posting the people. He spoke to the squadron commanding. He started posting the people who really wanted Pathfinder. Anyway, they didn't post me, so I became a Pathfinder. And 
Uh, what can I tell you about operations? We did it. 25,000 feet, we became Pathfinder Squadron, and we started in what was called the Battle of Berlin. Hitler had boasted that not a single bomb, our air bomb, would ever drop on Berlin. Our squadron, I was not on that one, our squadron decided Hitler was due to make a speech at 4 o'clock one afternoon in Berlin, and one of our crews were sent to drop a bomb on Berlin, bang on 4 o'clock, and Hitler was due to make a big boat out which we did. And I took a photograph of the I didn't know where it was now. But when they came back, I took a photograph of the aircraft because they had encountered quite a lot of flat. And a piece was taken out of one of the propellers. And I took a photograph of the crew and, and, and the piece, and the propeller with the piece bitten out. Anyway, Hitler's boat was made a nonsense. I think mounted the rostrum to make a speech. For our red bomb dropped on Berlin. Then Berlin, we the new Berlin thereafter as the milk run. I myself was bombed Berlin 21 times. Four of those times was, I think my pilot was at a bad pool or something, and you know, allowed to fly with the pool. 